welcome everybody uh, to Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. I'm your host, Larry Mendoza. And I'm Rick Wingrove. So thank you for uh, joining us, December 1st, 2013. Uh, the year's almost over. Time has certainly flown by. Wow. Uh, so we want to thank uh, all our viewers for uh, watching and uh, keeping up with us for the last few months. So a couple of things. Uh, we have a great show today. Uh, we have uh, Eric Cave from AskTheAtheist.com. Eric uh, has been an act active in the atheist community for quite a long time now. And so he's done all kinds of things from podcasts to, uh, you know, uh, websites to all, all kinds of things. And I met him went back in the days of the Rational Response Squad. That's when I first met Eric. He went by the name of uh, Jake Sage back then. So um, we're going to have on and we're going to be talking about a few things, uh, one of them being moderate uh, versus fundamentalist uh, theism. And uh, a couple other things that he has, uh, I think, from AskTheAtheist.com. He has some questions maybe that he can bring up and, uh, and talk about. Yeah, and maybe some people can even call in. That would be great. And ask some new and, questions. And ask some questions, absolutely. Before we get into that, though, let me uh, get, uh, get some announcements out of the way. Uh, the first thing is, again, there's still uh, issues over in the Philippines uh, because of the hurricane over there, the super storm that hit. Um, I would urge uh, our viewers to go to foundationbeyondbelief.org and see how you can help. Uh, you know, they, they need help out there. So if you can go on that um, website and see what you can do to, you know, they got all kinds of things you can do. Uh, the other thing is uh, help us out here at the show. Uh, we do accept donations. We want to make the show better. Uh, you can send, uh, obviously, donations to uh, the Fairfax County Public Access uh, TV station, and I think we have a, a graphic of that, of uh, the address here in a minute. Um, and if you cannot, uh, you know, if you don't have money to donate, you can certainly uh, come to the station and learn how to work uh, the booth back there. You know, we need hands on deck. So I guess we don't have the graphic for the, for the check, but you can... You can check out our YouTube channel and, and see some shows and uh, get the address there where you can donate. But also, also by the way, if you watch the show, you see it's a lot of guys on here. We could uh, use some uh, female help on this show too. Sure, sure can. So we can definitely do that. So, anyways, uh, so okay. Well, uh, having done that, um, oh, excuse me. Oh, your mic. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, Rick's mic was turned off, so hopefully... No, my mic is oh. actually turned on, nothing. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and talk about some news that have been uh, going on uh, that we would like to chat about. Uh, the first one being uh, the Pope Francis just uh, gave out a 254-page uh, you know, declaration from the Vatican, uh, sort of a mission statement, so to speak. And uh, one of the things that, that was interesting, uh, this Pope has been somewhat uh, controversial in a way, uh, for many reasons, but he's also been called uh, fairly progressive. And one of the things that, uh, you know, and I'm not really surprised about this, but he kind of seemed to condemn uh, money and, uh, and, in a way, capitalism, in a, in a way, and especially uh, trickle-down economics, which is a, you know, a hallmark of conservative uh, economic policies, which I found is interesting. Of course, he's still anti-abortion. That that is uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, things in the Catholic doctrine that will not be, uh, you know, will remain doctrine. But what I find interesting is, so conservative Reagan, Reaganite Catholics in this country, you know, how would they take this, you know? Uh, so you have a pope that says, you know, we don't, I don't believe in trickle-down economics and, in, in, in a sense, capitalism. So. Well, I heard, yeah. heard a great uh, analogy earlier. It's like a salad bar, not just a buffet, but a salad bar. Right. And uh, we'll all complain about some cheese or something on the salad bar, but we all like the salad bar. So. Right. So, yeah, I guess so. So I guess Catholics will have to choose between their spiritual leader and their, um, you know, political and economic hero. And I guess they'll have to figure that out. It'd be great if we did get some callers in to kind of maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, another thing, uh, last week we did a show on the lawsuits. Uh, the uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation just won recently a, a, a federal lawsuit that basically got, ri uh, got rid of the parsonage exemption for priests. So in other words, 
um, priests and preachers will have to pay taxes on property that they own and money that they get for buying property. Like everybody else. Like does. everybody else, exactly, like the rest of us. And also there's been, there's another, a uh, couple of other lawsuits going on right now from American atheists that are trying to level out the playing field within the IRS code about with 501c3s. It's essentially over the same things, the uh, benefits they get mm -hmm. that are not available uh, uh, not available to others that are available to them strictly on the basis of religion. Absolutely. And so, you know, all 501c3s, uh, in our opinion at least, should be uh, treated equally, and if government treats 1501c3 any different because of, re of, a, of religious affiliation, then certainly that shows, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I lost my train of thought. It shows, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was, can't think of the word. Yeah. Preference, preferential treatment, yeah, that's no. the word I'm oh, thinking that word. about. That word. Okay. So, the point I wanted to make that I wasn't able to make last week was uh, actually was brought up on um, uh, Brian Fields on my Facebook. He, he, he said it best. Uh, uh, Christians should not be uh, fighting or should embrace the uh, leveling field and, and the fact that preachers need to pay taxes basically because uh, for no other reason than a biblical one. One of the Gospels, Matthew uh, 22, 17 through 22 says, basically to summarize it, um, when uh, they, uh, uh, some citizens went to Jesus and says, hey, should we you know, pay uh, to Caesar? And the greatest uh, the saying was, um, uh, they said, uh, he unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So in essence, paying taxes is you know, in the Bible not just in the Constitution. So just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> so they should be perfectly happy. To, they should be perfectly to, happy. To help out, join the right. fair share. That's what could right. be fairer than that? Well, not to mention the fact that, you know, from, from a you know, more serious context, uh, churches pay, if churches were to pay uh, their fair share of taxes, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think, uh, I forget what the exact number was, but it's in the billions of dollars. Billions. And basically it's government subsidy, which yeah. clearly violates, in my opinion, the First Amendment. But not only that, that all those tax subsidies basically get uh, uh, pushed onto the middle class. Right, we pay for it, and by the way, it's not even in the Constitution that they should get these tax breaks. Right. That is a benefit, a privilege available to them on the basis of religion. One of those things that Congress is not supposed to do. Exactly, and so that's why these lawsuits are being filed. So anyway, so that's uh, another thing, another piece of news uh, that's been recent in case you guys missed last week's show, which you can also uh, view, I think, at some point on YouTube. We're gonna, put, we post all of our shows on YouTube, by the way, once they air. So, um, Another thing here uh, that was interesting, uh, there was recently a study done that showed that uh, religious people tend to be more charitable than non-religious, okay? Mm -hmm. On face value, that seems to be true. Religious people do give more to charity than non-religious people. But? But there's a caveat, <laughs> define charity. And as part of the, the charity, giving to your church is considered charity. And when you break that down now and you take away uh, money given to churches as opposed to, say, feeding the hungry or whatever, the playing field levels out a bit. And actually, there's not really much difference uh, from non-religious than religious mm -hmm. to giving to actual charities. Now, people can argue, well, churches give to charity. But really what I think the study found out is that what religion is, as any meme, it self-replicates. And one of the way it does that is it self-replicates by getting bigger and, and uh, getting uh, congregants of churches to give money, tithing to the churches. So yes, if you count that as being charitable, then sure. But uh, in my opinion, I don't think that giving money to a church in order to grow a church is in fact a charitable uh, giving. Well, especially not when a lot of uh, tithe is by subscription now, so it's more or less mandatory. It's not even voluntary anymore in many cases. Right, and not, not just uh, is it uh, mandatory, but you're kind of, uh, the church knows wh whether you're giving or you're not. And a prime example is a Catholic church, uh, at least the Catholic church that I grew up in here in the States. Uh, they will send uh, envelopes, self-addressed or, you know, with your name, and uh, they send them for the whole month. 
So I thought you were going to say they would send people to your house, but but they haven't done that yet. That, I don't but think. that's Scientology. That, that's Scientology, and I think the Mormons. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, but anyways, yeah, no, they do, and they know if you've been giving or you're not, and it kind of uh, sort of compels you. You know, you feel bad. It kind of guilts you into giving money if you don't. At least with the Catholic Church, and in some churches, I think in, in the Protestant churches, yeah. Baptist. Uh, they require a 10% tithing or whatever and the case that, may be. And that in no way satisfies the definition of voluntary. Right, exactly. Or charitable. Or charitable, indeed. So one, one more piece, I think uh, Rick has it, but I, I do want to talk about one more piece of news that I actually I heard on NPR this past week. There's uh, an organization called Zion Oil. Okay? It's owned by an evangelical Christian by the name of John Brown. And what this guy wants to do is he wants to go to Israel and dig for oil. And he went to Israel a few years back, had some kind of religious experience. And now what he's doing is that he's using uh, the old map of the 12 tribes of Israel to try to locate uh, where he can find oil. He believes that God has put oil in the ground in Israel for him to find. Now here's, here's the, kick, the kicker to all this thing. It, and the name in and of itself, Zion Oil, okay? Zion from Zionism. Uh, he's an evangelical Christian that supports uh, uh, Jewish Zionism and is part of the uh, broader uh, Christian Zionist movement that's a, actually a political movement that is, uh, that they want, to, they unilaterally support Israel in just about everything. They want Israel to return to its original, uh, you know, 12 tribe states. Uh, because of uh, you know because of the eschatological uh, endgame that they think that once all Jews return to Israel, Israel gets restored. Uh, therefore, Jesus comes down and the rapture begins and the end of days are here. Now, what's interesting to me is this is an example of a for-profit corporation, an oil-making entity, and it is uh, designed to make money. They have stakeholders, they have investors that want a return. Now, he hasn't found any oil yet, even though he's had this revelation from uh, God that he was going to find oil, but he hasn't found it yet. The problem is he's looking at this old map of the 12 tribes, which um, encompasses not just Israel, but encompasses lands in Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and some other countries where clearly, you know, trying to dig oil for Israel there is going to be a, a major problem. I don't think this guy is going to be crazy enough to start digging in, in Syria or Lebanon, but certainly there's going to be some disputed lands in Palestine where he's going to be digging for oil. And of course, that's going to cause, uh, I would imagine, even more bloodshed in that area. So, saying things could get worse. And things can get worse, and that's uh, an American evangelical Christian that started a, a, an American company based on biblical, uh, you know, uh, ideas. I'm going to have to look at the Bible again because I just I yeah. don't remember any of that. So. so, anyways, and I think, uh, Rick, you had a couple things, Just right? a couple yeah. of local items. Uh, Beltway Atheists, Nova Atheists are having our seventh annual Festivus party on December 14th. You can go to uh, Nova Atheists on Meetup or Beltway Atheists on Meetup and uh, RSVP to come to that. That's open to the entire local atheist community except for about three people who know who they are. And uh, you can also get that information and any other events in the area uh, from Woody Lipinski who has a very nice little weekly newsletter he puts out of all local atheist events. So look up Woody Lipinski. The other thing, I want to uh, tip of that hat to one of our local people. Uh, uh, just came out with a book. Linda La Scala has um, collaborated with Daniel Dennett to write a book about essentially um, preachers who have lost their faith and who find themselves in the pulpit. It's the uh, uh, clergy project, basically, mm -hmm. where Linda was um, instrumental in the uh, in the beginnings of this and the formation of uh, uh, the clergy the project. project. Yeah, so they have uh, their new book is out, and it's called. Let me get this right. Um, bear with. I apologize. Um, caught in. Uh, I'm sorry. Caught in the pulpit, leaving uh, belief behind, by Linda Lascala. 
and Daniel Dennett with a, a foreword by Richard Dawkins. It's available on uh, Amazon and Kindle. So anywhere you can buy check books, it out. I guess. Yep. Anywhere you can get books, good. I guess. So check it out, and that's all I've got local. Yep. Good. So. No, that's good. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, forgot to mention Festivus. Yeah. And also, by the way, another word on Festivus, real quick. We will have a raffle. We have uh, autographed copies of uh, books by uh, Andy Thompson. And actually, we have Andy Thompson's uh, book, Why We Believe in Gods. I think we have it in three different languages. One, uh, obviously, in, in, in English, in Urdu and also in Polish, uh, autograph copies. He's, he's trying to spread uh, the message uh, and he's trying to get publishers to publish his book in uh, many different languages, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, we also have a book, uh, book from Peter Bogosian. We're going to raffle that off. Uh, Richard Dawkins is going to be donating some stuff, autographed, of course, and things like that. Also some music CDs from uh, Tombstone uh, and uh, Sickness. There are uh, hip-hop artists uh, that uh, promote uh, skepticism and rationalism and things like that. So. But the main thing is the party. So, but the main thing is the party. So come, beer and food. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the topic at hand here, and let's introduce our guest, Eric Cave. Eric, how are you doing? Can you hear us? I'm doing okay. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today, Eric. Uh, it's it's a pleasure of having me. So, Eric Cave is uh, has a website called AskTheAtheist.com. Uh, and so, Eric, tell us, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your, I guess, your background. I understand you're an ex-Mormon. Right. I was uh, born and raised in the LDS Church as a Mormon. Um, went on a mission for two years in the North Dakota, South Dakota territories. Uh, came back, served on the bishopric of my, uh, my ward. And then when I was about uh, 24, 25 I uh, ran into a Buddhist monk, and we started talking, and uh, he basically gave me my first lessons in objectivity, and uh, from there, I, it was like a two-year process. I, I lost my faith and, and uh, considered myself an atheist after about two years. And then uh, from there, I uh, went on to... Um, kind of like, I, I'm the type of person that... When I learn something, I want to teach others. So I started producing a, a weekly podcast, uh, and then that segued into a uh, message board, and then that segued into uh, websites. And uh, today, I work with uh, AskTheAtheist.com. Right. And how long ago did you start doing this? I mean, I understand you were you were one of the first uh, people on the internet, so to speak, to start spreading the message, right? Well, that's that's. I don't know if that's actually yeah. true. You know, how do you? How do you sure, find sure, out sure. something like that? I'm not sure, but uh, I was doing it back in around 1998, right? Uh, something like that, and it was when Real Audio first came out, and uh, they had started uh, giving people a way to uh, stream their audio on the internet. And uh, as far as anybody can tell, I was one of the first ones uh, to do that. I helped to uh, uh, inspire other people to start their own websites and do more, and that's always made me you know, feel good. And, and right. uh, so I've been at this since the late nineties. Yeah. I guess you could say so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were doing atheism before atheism was cool, basically. Yeah. I was, I, well, yeah. well, when, when <laughs> I was doing, it was before Dawkins came out with anything or yeah. anybody heard of Sam Harris and, sure. and you know, uh, anybody know, knew who, you know, Hitchens was really, Things like that. In fact, uh, I had a few of them on some of my shows in the early days mm -hmm. uh, when they were first trying to get their their you know books out, and their names out, and, and what have you. So I was kind of like at the forefront of it. So I got to see a lot of interesting things along the way. Very good. And you were involved with the Rational Response Squad early on, right? Yeah, uh, Brian. I uh, <laughs> Brian Sapien, the guy that runs the Rational Response Squad, uh, has been a good friend of mine for a long time, along with. Uh, um, Thomas Renna, who was helping him with that, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually met Brian through you know, my website. It was a message board, atheistnetwork.com, and um, which is no longer you know around today. But um, <clears throat> at the time, he was a deist, and I deconverted him through some of the discussions, and he felt inspired and went on to start the Rational Responders. Right. And I understand you also helped Regin uh, Reginald uh, the, with the infidel yeah. guy start him up as well. 
Yeah, Reginald Finley, the uh, <clears throat> infidel guy, infidelguy.com. Um, he had been a fan of my uh, audio podcast, mm -hmm. and uh, he came to me and asked me how I did it and, and what I needed to do to set it up. And so we had all these conversations and talks over the years, and we just built up a nice friendship, and I helped him get that started. Oh, very good. Cool. So, yeah, well, that's great. No, it seems like you've been... Uh been doing a lot of uh, good work for the atheist community and spreading the word, and that's the kind of uh, commitment and people we really need in the atheist community. And I hope that carries well, I on. My best. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so when did you uh, start doing uh, um, Ask the Atheist? Um, I started doing that about five years ago, four years ago, something like that. Yeah, about five, four, about five years ago. And uh, that came along because I would always get these emails from people um, asking me, you know, what to do about this or what I thought about this. Some would be from uh, believers, some would be from atheists. And I noticed a lot of these subjects weren't actually being talked about on, you know, websites or message boards or what have you. These were kind of like personal things. So I took these and I thought, hey, this would be a really good website because these personal things kind of need to come out so that other atheists can relate to them or maybe even other believers can try to relate to them. So I created AskTheAtheist.com, got some help from uh, Brian who gave me some service, service space on uh, the Rational Response, uh, Responders website. And um, then later on, uh, he was having problems with his website and servers, so I started on my own. You know, put it on my own server, and it's been on my own server ever since. And uh, what we do is we take, we get an average of about two or three questions a week, and we put them up, and uh, we give a response to them, and then we ask other atheists to come in and give their own responses, you know, to to the question. So the idea is that you don't just get one person's response; you get a bunch of people's response, you know, and that will give you a, a better idea or maybe a broader spectrum of understanding. In fact, that's our that's our uh, motto for uh, Ask the Atheist is um, no bashing, just understanding. So we, we try to create a level of uh, respect and understanding between both believers and atheists. Right. And I think that's important, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, atheists right now uh, have built a reputation, I think, uh, of being just uh, Christian bashers. Uh, sure. You know, and and to some extent that's been uh, true, but not so much yeah. Christian ba uh, bashers, but bashing the religion, not so much Christianity, the people, Christianity uh, bashing. But, but you know, what what's bashing and what is uh, uh, legitimate concern? What are legitimate questions and criticism? And, and right. Criticism, and many times that is called bashing mm -hmm. when it's really not. Sure. Well, a lot of the times, I, I mean, my, my consideration of bashing is that when you're having a dialogue with someone, you're not really listening to their side. You're just waiting for your turn to respond. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times that's, that's you know, they, they'll, they'll pick on a certain phrase that a believer uses and, and or a certain fact, <laughs> you know, I, with quotations, <laughs> that, that, that they'll use. You know, what they turn around to do is that they just focus on that. They focus on what I call the fat of the argument rather than the meat. And a lot of believers do that, a lot of atheists do that. And that's when you start getting into the bashing because then you're not really focused on getting the other person to understand. You're just trying to get to the point where you're trying to win the argument. Right. And I think that a lot of the times ends up being, you know, either for the believer, it ends up being offensive. Or even for the non-believer, if it's coming out his way, it ends up being offensive and, you know, people get upset. Right, right. Yeah. I, I think that uh, you know there needs to be you know multiple approaches to to activism. Uh, Absolutely. And, and I completely agree with you, Eric. That uh, sometimes you know you need to have, you know to open up dialogue and to plant those seeds and to change people's minds. You need to be a little bit uh, you know understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, that that's a fair way to put it. Uh, on the other hand. You know, I also think that the criticism of religion needs to be outspoken. It needs to be out there and without being feared. And, it, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, actually, when we get into the second half. We're going to go on break here in a minute. But, but that we should not fear criticizing religion uh, uh, because of, you know, fear of call, being called either Islamophobes or Christian haters or whatever the case may be. No, we right. should... Um 
hammer them where hammering is due because uh, some of what they're selling is right. not good for people in general. And uh, so you, you have to criticize things that legitimately deserve criticism. Sure. So uh, we want, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. We're going to get into uh, some topics of uh, moderate uh, theism versus fundamentalist theism, mostly focusing on Christianity, I think. Here in a minute, we're going to take a three-minute break. And when we come back, we'll uh, come back with Eric, and we'll have a more conversation. So stay with us. This is Richard Dawkins. Doing commercials is unfamiliar territory for me, but I'm inviting you to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century, on Fairfax Public Access every Sunday. Each week the hosts tackle wishful thinking, religion, pseudoscience and the harm they cause, with a combination of facts, humour and community involvement. They challenge believers to defend their faith and give you, the skeptic, a voice. With live call-ins for viewers and streaming on the World Wide Web, there's never a dull moment. Don't wait. Look at them now on Facebook and YouTube. And remember to watch Road to Reason, a skeptic's guide to the 21st century. Or there'll be hell to pay. When I was younger, I didn't want to admit I had a serious disease. Because of my diabetes, I lost the sight in my left eye. Misconceptions continue to surround this monster public health issue. But the simple truth is, diabetes can often be prevented and complications avoided. You're not alone. Understand the realities of diabetes and know that you can manage it and lead a full, active life. Well, trouble with the uh, promos today, so well, we're, we're back. back. So, um, yeah, well, we're here to having a conversation with uh, Eric Cave of Ask the Atheist, and uh, we're going to get into some uh, interesting discussions here in a minute. One question I wanted to ask you also before we get into that is, you know, uh, can you talk a little bit more, well, a, a two-part question. When do you think the Internet really started uh, becoming essential in the atheist movement? And number two, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the rational response? Quote? I mean, I, I was part of that in the early days, uh, but clearly you were, you were there um, you know, from the way, way beginning. Uh, Brian had asked me at some point to, to come on. But can you give us a little insight on when you think really the Internet was essential for our movement? Um, I probably saw the, the influence of it in the early, uh, the early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> My experience was with uh, certain chat programs like PalTalk, and you started seeing a lot of atheists getting on PalTalk and just complaining about things and talking about religion, and there would be these uh, big discussions, and that got more and more popular amongst atheists where the PalTalk chat rooms were starting to become really, really filled up. I mean, there was also things like all dot atheism, you know, news groups, but most people didn't have access to news groups, or at least they didn't know how to access news groups. So chat programs kind of came into their own about that time for people, as well as as well as message boards. So somewhere around 2003 is when I started really seeing the internet play its part. That's where you started seeing uh, book authors start to, um, <clears throat> you, you know, talk to people on the internet and promote their stuff on the internet and and uh, you know sell sell their wares so to speak on on the internet and. As the internet became more accessible to people, especially to younger people, um, that's when you started seeing, you, you know, I would get search results, uh, you, you know, back and it would be like, uh, where is God? How do I find God? 
uh, is there a God, you know, things like that. So I think that's probably about the early 2000s is re really when we started seeing it, seeing it happen. Good. Okay. We, so, uh, we have the actual uh, atheist, atheist answer guy on, so good time if you ever thought about calling into the show. Mm -hmm. This would be a good time to sure. ask an atheist. Ask an so, atheist. <laughs> but uh, Eric, uh, we're going to talk about the questions now. Well, yeah, yeah but first, real quick, I think uh, just one thing. Uh, can you just give a very brief synopsis of the Rational Response Squad and what it did for the atheist movement and what was one of the sure. biggest, biggest, uh, I think, accomplishments, which, you know, uh, that they did so well one of the things that I, I really liked about it was that Brian tried to take it in a direction that it would get to the most amount of people and he went on um, I, I know he, him and uh, Kelly uh, went on uh, ABC Nightline and uh, debated um, Kirk Cameron and um, what's his name Banana Man, Banana um, Man. Uh, Ray Comfort Ray Comfort right and I think that was kind of like the explosion and also, along with, there was a video, uh, The God uh, Who Wasn't There, or something like that, I think that was the name of it. The God uh, Who Wasn't There, yeah. Yep. Right, and uh, there was a promotional thing to go along with that called um, uh, The Blasphemy Challenge. Right. And I think he had a lot of really good ideas about promoting. Brian's a good promoter. He knows how to get the word out. He knows how to get people's attention. He knows how to be pro... Uh, uh, provocative when he feels he needs to be and he knows when to kind of tone it down a little bit. I mean, of course, that was a, something he had to learn along the way and I was trying to be there to, to, to advise him and to help him uh, to do it. But he gained the uh, attention of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably his biggest, biggest thing, whether you agreed with him or not, mm -hmm. he got your attention and he got you at least interested in the subject. Well, I will tell you one thing, the blasphemy challenge certainly got the attention of a lot of news media uh, for right. the simple reason that it targeted and it uh, affected a lot of the younger generation, which that really got people's attention because uh, we right. saw, I mean, you know, it was thousands upon thousands of, of people that started um, engaging in a blasphemy challenge. And for those right. of you who, who weren't familiar with the blasphemy challenge, it was basically uh, put up a... a uh, a short video on YouTube, uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is the one unforgivable sin in the Bible. And you do that, right. you know, you're pretty much, you secure your, your path to hell, essentially, yeah, right. is what, what that was. And so we had so many people. I mean, I don't, do you remember how many people, uh, I mean, how many videos the Blasphemy Challenge? There were, well, there were uh, a lot. I mean, yeah. thousands, I believe. And, and I think one of the things is that shocked people the most of the about was how many youth, how many young people yeah were taking the blast from the challenge. And it wasn't really a surprise to me because I was getting emails uh, from youth and the most common question was things like, how do I tell my parents that I'm an atheist? Mm -hmm. Or my, my, you know, I would get the occasional email that would break my heart saying, my, I told my parents I'm an atheist and now they're kicking me out of the house. So there was this fear amongst the youth that was obvious to me and they wanted to come out and they wanted to feel free to talk about their, their lack of belief, but they were afraid to because of their parents or because of their, uh, you know, the community that they, they grew up in. So when the Blasphemy Challenge came out, a lot of youth took the challenge, and I think that's what shocked a lot of people. But to me, I just kind of said, okay, I get it. You know, they're doing it because they don't think their parents are going to see them on YouTube <laughs> or they don't think their friends are going to see them on YouTube, so it gives them a certain amount of anonymity and uh, it's a way for them to express their disbelief or lack of belief, however you want to put it. Right. So, yeah, that was how it seemed to me at the time, lots of youth. I, yep. I've been asked that same thing also, but uh, more importantly, I've been asked, you know, my parents have threatened to uh, cut off my college funds if I'm an atheist. Right. So what do you say to right. a kid like that? It, you know, yeah, well, I, I get questions like, how do I tell my parents? Uh, how do you tell your date that you're an atheist? Um, how, you know, how do I tell my, my friends that I'm an atheist? You know, that's, the, that's a common question I get from, um, you know, newbie atheists, you know, the, that are just coming out of the, the atheist closet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my answer is usually very much the same. You know, when it comes to people and their parents, what I usually tell them is, hey, look, 
you know, until you're 18, you're under your parents' thumb. You know, you got to live by your parents' rules. It's, it's these, these. This is how your parents are trying to raise you. This is what you got to do. You can try to get them to understand. You can try to get them, you know, to be sympathetic and and let you follow your own path. But if they don't, then you're stuck having to, you know, do what your parents tell you to do. Right. I always encourage them. When and the one thing I I say more than anything else is be more than they expect you to be. Right. You know, if if their understanding of an atheist is someone who's self-centered, someone who only looks out for themselves, someone who doesn't want to do good, then be selfless, look out for others, and be charitable. Absolutely. And on that we, note, uh, it's interesting. We have a, a phone call. Joe is on the line. Uh, can we patch him in? Hey, Joe, can you hear us? Sure can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, we sure can. Yeah, uh, thanks ahead. for calling in. Well, thanks. Hey, Eric, thanks very much for the service that you perform for the in the cause of reason, I really appreciate it. Um, and I also want to say that I joined the Mormon Church when I was 16, living in Italy, and then left when I was 28 after I attended BYU and moved out to Virginia. Um, and what I find remarkable is that it's been 25 years since I left the church, and yet it still leaves vestiges behind. Um, it, it, and I just wonder how deep does this stuff go that you know eventually. <laughs> You never really get rid of it totally, 100%. Um, and the only other, I'd like to ask that question, then maybe make another comment too. Sure. Go ahead. The, the only way you can really get the uh, Mormon Church to leave you alone is if you send them a letter. You have to oh, send no, no. it to the uh, state presidency. And no, no. You have to tell them that you no longer <laughs> wish uh, to be counted in the church records. Yeah, no, I think, I think Eric, I think what he's trying to say is uh, he's commenting on, you know, religion cer certainly impacts you very deeply in many ways. And when you try to leave the church, there's vestiges, as he says. I mean, an example that I have is, is uh, in a Catholic, you know, you always have this, uh, what's called mia culpa, you know, this guilt right. that kind of sticks with you. And I guess the question that? that you're asking, right. Joe, is that how, how, you know, how deep does it go, correct? Oh yeah, it goes yes, really deep. Fact, I mean, uh, a lot of it is it's uh, how we wire ourselves. You know, um, there are certain there are certain hymnals that if I hear them today, I get that feeling inside of me, that burning in the bosom, and and you know that ex that, that mm -hmm. tingly feeling inside that as a, as a Mormon you're taught to um, think that it's the Holy Ghost coming to you. You know, but now as I'm as I understand more of the psychological effects of of group thinking and of how. Uh, religion can get into your mind and, and how it can, the mind is always trying to self-justify itself mm -hmm. that uh, where these feelings actually come from. So yeah, I, I still experience some of those things, you know, to this day. And I don't, you know, the only thing you can do is just kind of like not pay too much attention to them so that they don't, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, focus okay. on you too hard. Um, and just kind of accept that they're there. And by accepting that, that, it, that it still happens, it kind of starts to lose its impact after a while. Yeah, and, it's almost it's almost know, like quitting smoking. You know, sure, I still feel a little <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, I remember feeling this way, but the impact isn't as strong as it yeah. used to be. But, but you make sure. a good point there, where you uh, uh, analogize it's a rewiring. It is literally yep. you're yeah. rewired for it. What what else did yeah. you have, Joe? And Eric, uh, I do want to say that unlike mo most of my friends who did leave the Mormon Church as well. I did make it a point to ask for um, my name to be, my name and my wife as well to be removed from the church's records, and it took some doing to finally get them to do that. Uh, but it, it was a sense of closure as well at the time. Um, and in fact, uh, one interesting thing that happened to me was that a year or so after I left the church, I was going for a uh, top secret clearance, and I failed one question on the on the uh, polygraph. They asked me to come back on, on the following Monday to take the polygraph again and think about why I had failed that question, perhaps. Uh, when I went back, I passed this time because they asked it in the right way. The question hmm. was, have you ever committed a major crime? Hmm. And I failed that question. And when I went back and said, the only thing I could think of was that about a year ago, I left the Mormon church, and I'm still feeling a lot of guilt over that. So they re-asked the question with that in mind, and I passed. Yeah. Wow. That is very interesting, and, and Joe, we want to thank you for calling in and, and sharing sure. that with us. And that is very interesting, exactly, because it is essentially a rewiring of the brain. It is essentially, uh, you know, how you think about your whole worldview, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, something that 
you consider it to be a crime uh, is not really a crime, but that's how your brain thinks. And then, of course, there's the physiological effects that come with that, which is why you know you fail the polygraphs. So that's very interesting. But well, thank you for calling, Joe. Um, Eric, let's uh, move on to um, kind of one of the topics I did want to talk about, and maybe it can tie into a little bit in. Uh, in your website, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about moderate versus fundamentalist, um, and let's take Christianity for example. Though we can certainly talk about other religions as well. Uh, sure. So you know, right now there's there's all well there actually has always been this uh, idea of uh, moderate Christianity versus fundamentalist Christianity, and and even amongst atheists they debate these issues that maybe we shouldn't be so harsh in Christianity because there's a lot of moderates out there. We see the same kind of uh, thing with Islam. You know, people that um, uh, will say, well, you know, you're being you know stereotypical and Islamophobic by criticizing Islam. Not all Muslims are like that. Not all Christians are you know Bible thumping. So I want to talk a little bit about that because I think I it's can, important for people. I can to tell understand. you why I think that happens. Was that? Well, I think I think what you're seeing in Islam today is what you saw in Christianity around Gutenberg's time when he started producing mass producing the Bible. When people had access to the Bible, you know, before people didn't have access to the Bible. The Bible was only read to them by their priests. But when people started having access to the Bible, was able to read the Bible for themselves, they found that there were certain things in the Bible that they didn't like. And so what that's where you started to get your offshoots. So you started getting your different sects. And each sect interpreted the Bible in their own different way, according to the things that they didn't like and the things that they did like. And after a while, Christianity, which was this very you know, this religion of, of taking over things and, and, you know, bringing things into their, themselves, like they would take over a lot of pagan holidays and, and things like that. What you started to see was you started seeing them more lean towards, oh, you know, we're not all about the carry the sword part. We're more about the peace and love part. Ignore the part of the Bible that says, you know, go and kill these unbelievers. We're not really about that anymore because we don't like that. And I think now in Islam, as you're starting to see the Quran more produced where people are able to read the Quran for themselves, study the Quran for themselves, which until really the last 40 years, they weren't able to do. Mm -hmm. And now as you're starting to see that, you're starting to see the, the uh, Muslims come out and say, you know what, uh, ignore the part about, uh, you know, the kill the unbeliever. That's mm -hmm. uh, not how we view it. We don't see it that way. Again, you know, you make, you make a good point there. Um, and, and it's really, you know, the analogy that Rick made earlier about the salad bar, um, you know, we'll pick and choose the part we like. Now, here's the thing, you know, I, I do want to spend a little bit of time on, on uh, a little bit of history about American fundamentalism, which is relatively new. And it started uh, in the late 19th to the early uh, 20th century. Uh, and it basically uh, has basically four tenets to it, evangelism, uh, dispensationalism, uh, Princeton theology and uh, uh, a set of, or a book uh, called The Fundamentals that was published between 1910 and 1915. And these are all kind of uh, um, a, a response to liberalism and modernism in the church. Uh, yeah. And it was back during the Great Awakening, the First Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, these tent revivals during the 18 and 19 and early, you know, that's when really all this biblical liberalism started and it's and it, it propelled I think what we see today in uh, it was the beginning of a political movement and which is why I think we see um, uh, fundamentalists uh, putting a lot of money into politics these days which is more so important why we need to have lawsuits from secular organizations to to kind of fight that but you know just real quick just to to, to give some uh, some definitions to what I was talking about. Evangelism uh, emerged in the uh, in the revivals of the first great, uh, the first and second great awakenings in in America and in England between the period of 1730 and 1840, and uh, it it derives from uh, a couple of things: uh, Pietism, Presbyterianism, and the vestiges of Puritanism. I believe is where this uh, evangelical form of religion came about. And, um, you know, that mixed in with something called dispensationalism, which is uh, a new interpretation of the Bible that developed in, in the 1830s, uh, mostly in England, which divided time into several different stages called uh, dispensations. 
uh, which were seen as uh, stages of God's revelation. And I think at, e at the end of each stage, according to this theory, God punished humanity for having been found uh, wanting in God's testing. In other words, and, and things like, you know, the, the uh, secularism, the growth of secularism, moderatism, liberalism, all these things we're seeing uh, from the fundamentalists as, as a kind of a dispensational uh, time period. And so, of course, you know, th that's where this whole idea of uh, the rapture and Jesus coming back and, and Christ's return in Armageddon kind of came from. But also, Princeton theology, this is um, another tenet of this, which is the doctrine of uh, biblical inerrancy, which is what, one of the big things that we see in fundamentalist is biblical uh, inerrancy. And of course, that's all kind of put together in these, these uh, a series of books, or at least a, a publication called The Fundamentals, um, uh, which has uh, uh, the inerrancy of the Bible, the, li the literal nature of biblical accounts. In other words, you know, these things actually happened historically, whatever is in the Bible, and the virgin birth of Christ, as well as the bodily resurrection, physical return of Christ, um, and of course the uh, substitutionary atonement of, of, of sins of Jesus dying on a cross. Now I think these, th this kind of sums up a little bit fundamentalists and what they are in this country today. Now I want to talk, okay, fine, you want to buy into that idea, that's a fundamentalist view. Modernists or moderates, what are they really and how do they differ from fundamentalists? Can you maybe talk a little bit about that, Eric, in your opinion? Well, I, I really think that that's a, there's a gray line that's there between moderate and, and fundamentalists. I mean, the simple answer is to be, is to give that a moderate is someone who doesn't really, isn't outspoken about their, uh, their beliefs and, and you know, they're, they're more quiet and reserved to themselves. But at the same time, it's the moderates that help to allow the fundamentalists to be as loud as they are by, you know, not speaking out against them. You know, for instance, a, a great example would be Westboro ba Baptist Church, mm -hmm. you know, very fundamentalist, uh, very evangelical. And it hasn't really been until, they've been around for quite a while, but it hasn't really been until the last four or five years that you've started seeing other religions speak out against them. Sure. Before they existed uh, well within the religious community because, you know, no one told them to shut up. Right. So the, uh, the, the, the main line between fundamentalist and moderate to me is a, is a blurred one because at what point does a person become... A, if they're moderate, they, what part, point do they become, uh, you, you know, evangelical or fundamentalist? Is it because they start practicing, you know, what they preach, or is it because they actually start taking it literally, you know? And then, what, how many things do they have do they have to take literally before they're considered a fundamentalist? I know fundamentalists that still don't take part of the Bible literally. Sure. You, you, you know, they, they still look at, oh, that part's just allegory, or or that part's just poem, poetic uh, licensing, you, you know. Yeah. Allegory. So and yeah. to me, it's just this blurred line that I'm not always sure exists. You yeah, know, it's it's you, you only notice the hardcore fundamentalist, but there's a moderate fundamentalist as well, and there's a lower fundamentalist as well. So yeah, yeah uh, two th couple of things about um, moderates is that uh, does, you you make a good point that this is the blurry line. What is a moderate? If we look at a current local lesson, moderate Republicans, for instance. I'm not picking on them, I just want to point out that moderate Republicans vote 100% with the most radical Republicans right now. And it begs the question, if uh, they start burning atheists again, which side of the, who, who are the, the moderates going to be standing with there? So, right. so what you does know, moderate really I, mean? I think, yeah, exactly. But I think, uh, I think one of the important uh, points to take out of this um, and, and I agree with Sam Harris when he talks about moderates. Uh, and there's, according to Sam Harris, uh, there's uh, two myths uh, that keep faith beyond the fray of rational criticism. And I think that's the important point here about moderates is that they will stop you from criticizing religion in general because they say, wait a minute, you know, don't criticize the religion because, you know, uh, it's the crazy people uh, that are doing all the crazy things in the name of religion, not the religion itself. But they share exactly the same core beliefs as those people who blew up the clinics. Absolutely. And so I just want to kind of reiterate what Sam's response uh, to these is like, there's, okay, so these two myths now keep faith beyond 
the fray of rational criticism, and they seem to foster both religious extremism as well as religious mo uh, moderation equally. And these two myths, uh, according to Sam, are as follows. Most of us believe that there are good things that people get from religious uh, experience, uh, religious faith, like strong communities, uh, ethical behavior, spiritual experience, that cannot be had elsewhere. In a second myth, he thinks, uh, many of us also believe that the terrible things that are sometimes done uh, in the name of religion are the products not of faith per se, uh, but of our baser natures, such as uh, greed, hatred, and fear, for which religious beliefs are themselves the best, if not the only remedy. And then taken together, uh, these myths seem to have granted us perfect immunity to outbreaks of reasonable discourse on religion. Right. And I think that, that says it right there. So, you know, in essence, moderate religions sort of give the platform for the fundamentalists to stand on. And I think that's a right. very interesting uh, perspective. You know, the, the moderates will protect the fundamentalists because uh, the moderates don't really know how or want to defend their faith. And they know that the only people out there that are really defending their, their faith, even if they disagree with them on some points, are the fundamentalists. You know, most moderates, they don't really know that much about their own faith. Mm -hmm. So when you challenge them, you know, they don't really know how to respond. And they'll even look to fundamentalists for their responses. You, you talk to, I, I, I talk to moderates on AskTheAtheist.com who are trying to study their own religion and they're not studying their religion from other moderates, they're studying their religion from the fundamentalist evangelical people. Right, right. And, 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 at the, and as Rick mentioned earlier, at the core of all religion, whether it's Christianity or Islam, the holy books are the holy books. And whether you're a moderate of a, and you accept, say, other religions, um, the stokes, uh, the fire, the stokes of, uh, or I mean, the, the fire of hell has been stoked because uh, the, your doctrine, whether you care to believe it or not, says that if you are not saved by Jesus Christ in the case of Christianity, you are going to hell. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And that's a, a, a you know, a lot of moderates consider that a very uh, fundamentalist uh, viewpoint, although it's doctrinal. I mean, I, I don't see any other way to, to really separate that from, yeah. from you know, from uh, the fundamentalists. This is um, pretty heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask the atheist a question that really has perhaps more relevance to many atheists, and that is, how do you tell your date you're an atheist? <laughs> yeah, that was actually a uh, question that was was asked a uh, couple of weeks ago on the, on the website, and uh, there was a, a guy that uh, you know said, "Hey, I live in a very you know ultra religious area, and um, I go to church, and uh, you know, but I don't really believe. And whenever I go on a date with a girl, the girls are usually very religious, and the one thing they ask me is, where do I go to church? And how do I tell them, you know, that, that I'm an atheist? And my my advice to them was, or to this person was, basically, um, I talked about what's called in sales is the boat strategy. And boat strategy is the idea that if you can get the other person to think that you're in the same boat that they are in, they will be more open to listen to you. And if you just tell a person not straight out, oh, I'm an atheist, they're going to bring up their own judgments. They're going to bring up their own, you know, idea of thinking. And so you, what you have to do is you have to create the idea that an atheist isn't a bad thing without actually bringing up the word atheist. So you can use, you know, other words, uh, non-believer or, you know, if you, even if you want to, humanist, and, and that will start a discussion. And that's what you really want to do. You just don't want to drop a big bomb of a word on a person who you know is going to prejudge it. What you want to do is you want to say, hey, um, you know, I don't have a, a church yet. And they'll, they'll think, well, why don't you? And you can say things like, well, you know, I think this way and I have a problem with this and I have a problem with that. And that person will come up, well, what do you think about this? And you'll start a dialogue, you'll start a discussion. And by starting a dialogue and starting a discussion, you get that person to relate to you more rather than if you just drop a, a heavy bomb of a word on them. You know, so that's that was my advice to that person is is to get them into a discussion about it first, uh, make them think that you know they have questions too, you have questions too, so you're not really that dissimilar. Mm -hmm. 
Right. You know, yeah, I've, I've probably did it wrong. I've uh, been married <laughs> twice and both women on the very first date, I just told them, look, I'm an atheist. I guess I was figuring, let's get this out of the way. Let's not waste any time on this if this isn't going to work. Right. And they both ended up marrying me. You so. know, I, I think it depends on the situation. Even going back to how do you come out to your family uh, right. with your, you know, your atheist. I think it definitely has a lot to do on the dynamics of your family. Um, and how open they are to new ideas, and you can gauge that. Oftentimes, uh, you might, you know, it might be better just to keep it to yourself for the time being until yeah. maybe you move out of the house. It depends on the, it, of course, it all depends on, on the family, and, and, and every person and every family is going to react differently to this idea, just like any date would, you know. Um, yeah, sometimes starting well, sometimes a dialogue is just, the best way to do it. It's just not appropriate to tell certain people. Like someone wrote in and said, hey, I, 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 most of the people in my family know that I'm an atheist, but I can't tell my grandmother yeah. that I'm an atheist because I think it would just like break her heart. Break her heart, right. And my response was, well, then don't tell her. I mean, exactly. it's obviously not appropriate to tell your grandmother because you don't want to cause her any kind of pain. Well, I, 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 will, I, mean, I will tell you one thing. This is kind of a personal short story that I'm, I'm a, you know, share here. When I went to Italy a few years back. My aunt was dying of pancreatic cancer, and she was literally on her deathbed. And the one thing she said to me was, uh, don't worry, because God loves us most when we suffer. This is on her deathbed. And right. I had to literally leave the room because I could not help but uh, burst out into tears because it's just such a horrible thing. But what do you tell a person at that point? You know, That's what they have to cling on. And it was very tough. It was very difficult. Yeah. thing to do. So yeah, it depends, again, on the dynamics and what's it, going on. It does. And Absolutely. I mentioned earlier, what do you, what do you tell uh, somebody that's about to go to college if their parents want to cut them off if they're an atheist? I have yeah. reluctantly told some people, just don't tell them. Yeah. Do not yeah. destroy your future over this one point. There's plenty of time. Deal with it later. Yeah. And there, and there will well, be a, good, a right time. The, the analogy I always make is, look. So, so Eric, we got a, 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 literally like about 20 seconds, 20 seconds left, so real okay, quick. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Make your point no, real quick. The, the, what, I, what I usually tell them really fast is that there are a lot of things that we don't tell our, our family and our friends because it's not appropriate. You know, if you're into uh, tying up people with string of frogs, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't tell them that because they might not look at it the right way. So, you know, sometimes it's just not appropriate yep. to tell people that's, what your that's it. religious so, belief or non-religious belief Eric, Thank you, Eric. We got to go. We're out of time. But thank you very much for joining us. Maybe you can come back on. We have, I mean, obviously, we just touched the tip of the iceberg here. But thanks so, for coming. Thank and uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next time.